Hello everyone. In this video of the shoulder complex palpation series, we are going to learn the palpatory skills to accurately localize and palpate the remaining important structures of the shoulder complex, namely the coracoid process followed by the palpation of the lesser tubercle of humerus, the intertubercular sulcus and finally the greater tubercle of the humerus. Also, we will be providing tips to accurately determine the orientation of the glenoid cavity. These palpatory skills will enable the therapist to perform palpatory assessments and treatments like C-Rex cross friction massage for a variety of shoulder problems. So let's get started. So the palpation for the anterior lateral structures of the shoulder joint starts by first locating the infraclavicular fossa. Now this can be accurately located by the physiotherapist by first asking the patient to flex the shoulder joint which actually activates the anterior fibers of the deltoid muscle and then horizontally adduct the shoulder against the therapist resistance which activates the sternal and the clavicular head of the pectoralis major muscle. Now as we can observe here the infraclavicular fossa is bounded medially by the lateral edge of the pectoralis major muscle and laterally by the medial edge of the anterior fiber of the deltoid muscle. Superiorly we have the clavicle bone. So after the therapist has located this particular fossa, the arm will be brought back down to the neutral position. So it is advisable that the therapist should keep the middle finger in the infraclavicular fossa region. Now the next step is to palpate the coracoid process and for this the therapist needs to just increase the pressure of the middle finger in the lateral direction and the bony resistance that will be met will actually be the middle border of the coracoid process. So this actually means is that if I just place my index finger beside the middle finger I will be right on the coracoid process. So now I have marked the location of the coracoid process. Now next step would be to identify the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So for this what the therapist can do is, therapist can now shift the location of the palpating middle and index finger. So now the middle finger is going to come over the coracoid process and the index finger is going to start palpating more laterally. Immediately lateral to the coracoid process, the therapist is going to find a depression and this depression is actually separating the coracoid process from the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Now what this means is that if I again shift my middle finger into the depression, the index finger is now going to be over the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Now at this point the therapist can also perform movement testing to confirm the location of the lesser tubercle. For this the therapist can place the middle finger over the coracoid process and the index finger over the tentative region where the therapist believes the lesser tubercle is. Now the patient will be asked to perform the shoulder external and internal rotation movement and characteristically what the therapist is going to find is that there will be no movement of the coracoid process happening during this internal and external rotation movement whereas the elevated lesser tubercle as well as the subscapular tendon which is attached right here can be felt moving underneath the palpating pad of the left index finger. So if we closely observe the structure of the lesser tubercle, we can conclude that it is broader superiorly and it keeps on fading as we go on in the inferior direction. So the shape actually refers to an inverted teardrop shape. So the same thing can be observed here. When the therapist is going to locate the lesser tubercle, the therapist is going to palpate it using the perpendicular palpation method. and as the therapist will start moving inferiorly, the elevation will keep on reducing and at one point it will merge with the shaft of the humerus. Now the best way to palpate the insertion of the subscapular tendon over the lesser tubercle is to place the palpating finger pad over the lesser tubercle and then position the shoulder in the end range of external rotation. Now what this does is this actually tenses the subscapularis muscle and therefore the tendon actually starts pushing the palpating finger pad anteriorly. Now if the therapist presses down, therapist can feel a firm and elastic resistance over the tendon. Now again the therapist can place the pad of the middle finger over the lesser tubercle 
and again start palpating in the lateral direction. Now immediately adjacent to the lesser tubercle there will be a depression which is our intertubercular sulcus and immediately lateral to the intertubercular sulcus we will have our greater tubercle of the humerus. Now therefore we can say that this intertubercular sulcus actually forms the lateral boundary of the lesser tubercle of the humerus and medial boundary of the greater tubercle of the humerus. Another interesting point that should be noted is that the subscapularis muscle projects forward and outwards from the lesser tubercle in the form of transverse ligament which ensures that the long head of biceps remains in this groove, the bicepital groove and does not comes out of it. The position of this bicepital groove or the intertubercular sulcus can also be confirmed by movement testing. So if the therapist places the pad over this depression and again goes for the passive or active shoulder internal and external rotation, the medial and lateral edges of the groove can be felt moving underneath the palpating pad. So basically the medial edge of the bicepital groove is nothing but the lateral border of the lesser tubercle of the humerus and the lateral edge of the bicepital groove is nothing but the medial border of the greater tubercle of the humerus. So the palpation of the greater tubercle and its three facets which serves as the insertion point for the sit muscle starts from this point. So best way to remember and palpate the three facets of the greater tubercle is that the anterior facet is oriented almost perpendicularly to the shaft of the humerus whereas the middle facet is oriented at 45 degrees whereas the posterior facet is oriented exactly parallel to the shaft of the humerus. So now this needs to be again palpated and confirmed through transverse or perpendicular palpation technique. So the best way to confirm the location of the anterior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus which serves as the insertion point for the supraspinatus muscle is to place the lateral or the radial border of the distal phalanx of the index finger just lateral to the acromial spine. And now from here the therapist can feel the projected out elevation of the anterior facet. And as the therapist moves ahead or anteriorly the therapist can feel the depression of the intertubercular sulcus. And if the therapist goes more in the outward direction, this elevation will be lost laterally. As the therapist palpating finger pad keeps on palpating the anterior facet from the anterior to posterior direction, what the therapist is going to find is that at one particular point, the palpating finger is going to come in the downward direction. And this is actually the starting of the middle facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus, which is the insertion point of the infraspinatus muscle. So the middle facet is bounded laterally again by the lateral edge of the acromion spine. So in the similar way either the palpating finger pad of the index finger or the thumb keeps on palpating in the posterior direction what the therapist is going to feel now is that the thumb is going to drop down in the inferior direction at one particular point and this is actually the starting of the posterior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus which serves as the insertion point for the teres minor muscle. So just a quick recap. So we have the anterior facet just perpendicular to the shaft of the humerus. We keep on palpating posteriorly. We feel that the thumb is getting dropped down. This is the middle facet. Again keep on palpating posteriorly. Again the thumb is going to drop down and this is the posterior facet. Now these palpatory techniques can come very handy and can be very useful for a therapist when he or she needs to find out the exact tendon which is at fault and is causing shoulder pain. Also by accurately palpating a particular tendon the therapist can also deliver the accurate and precise palpatory treatment strategies such as the C-Rex cross friction treatment. 
Now to finally determine the orientation of the glenoid cavity which is actually an extension of the spine of the scapula all the therapist needs to do is to connect the line from the acromion angle to the inferior part of the glenoid cavity and this is actually the direction in which the glenoid cavity opens up. So the glenoid cavity is actually oriented around 20 to 30 degrees away or anteriorly to the frontal plane and it opens up in the lateral anterior and superior direction. So this was all about the shoulder palpation skills that a physiotherapy student must know in order to diagnose and treat variety of shoulder problems. I sincerely hope that the shoulder palpation series is going to be helpful for you all. Do keep motivating us with your comments and feedback and do share the physio classroom videos with your contacts. See you all in our next video. Till then, keep learning, keep, keep sharing learning. and stay connected.